Welcome to the Open Door Real Estate Podcast, where we will be opening the doors to the minds of those who own, you got it, multiple doors, and all professionals in relation. Today's podcast is brought to you by Barnett Capital, working with equity partners to create wealth through multifamily real estate. Let us do the work while you enjoy the returns. Today's host is the one and only Matt Barnett. Get ready to open your mind because we are about to do so to those who own multiple doors. All right, what is going on, everybody? Today, uh, not only do I have an amazing guest, I have the very first guest on the Open Door Real Estate Podcast, Mr. Reed Starkey. So actually, I'm going to go ahead and jump right into this, and then I do have some good things I want to ask you. But beforehand, for those people who do not know who Reed is, Reed has been a full-time real estate investor since 2015 with over 50 investment deals under his belt. Reed uh, also has both his builder's license and real estate license. Reed's career started in the automotive industry with over 15 years of leadership as a high achiever in multiple big box stores, such as CarQuest Auto Parts as the prestigious President's Award winner and at O'Reilly's Auto Parts Managing Store of the Year. Reed is a highly accomplished and skilled managing, oh, Reed is highly accomplished and skilled in managing projects and people, as well as delivering exceptional service and results. Reed's passion for combining his leadership skills and interests in real estate investments has led him to host the Starkey Multifamily Family Podcast, which I highly recommend. We'll get into that, as well as hosting events related to the industry, such as the Starkey Multifamily Meetup and co-host of the Dirty House Buyers Meetup. As a leader of his household, Reed has been married for eight years and has two young boys to help fuel his passion to invest in the future of other families and contribute to the success of the community. How about that? Did that sum it up? Yeah, that's good. Thank you. <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate you being on here as a first guest. Um, your, you know, I talked to your assistant prior to here, and obviously I asked for like the logos and your headshot and stuff. Now, she sent me a logo that I want to ask you about. All right. And we're going to get into a few other things here, but she sent me something that was multifamily connections. So she sent me this uh, logo, it's Multifamily Connections. What, tell me about that. Uh, yeah, I have a partner, uh, Dan Ingdahl, and so we um, started working together a while ago in pursuing multifamily. So we've been uh, out pursuing, kind of uh, trying to get uh, our, a deal under contract so that we can close on it. Uh, so kind of that's been my whole ambition and motivation for the podcast and the meetups is just to kind of get out there and document the meet uh, the podcast is basically to document all the people that I talk to and all the things that I learn and acquire on the road to getting into multifamily. <laughs> Excuse me. Cause I think, uh, you know, what you look at is you see a lot of the people who are selling something telling you how easy it is and how anybody can do it. And, um, you know, and then also people who have been doing it for a while thinking, saying that it's easy and all this stuff, but, um, of course it's easy once you've done it and been through it, you know? So uh, in my world, you know, I, I look at flipping houses as being mostly for the most part, pretty easy, but I also try and remember that first house and how terrifying it was and, and, you know, how difficult it was to get to that. So, you know, in the same perspective, I'm trying to, document that journey and how it really is and how how difficult and uh, the struggles to get there that's amazing so it's like you're getting like the behind the scenes like people when you go to the obviously present at these meetups and stuff you're going to hear the good side of, of multifamily real estate you're bringing out the real side you know like the ins and outs of everything like you're not hiding anything yeah well i have nothing to sell so i, I have no no training no mentoring no no uh you know three thousand dollar course to tell is to sell you so I, I mean that's kind of a, a distinct advantage that I think I have is is my only you know the only thing that I gain from these is is getting networking and and meeting some pretty cool people so that's that's my motivation so I I, I think that puts me in a different category I believe but absolutely so providing exceptional value and actually I want to touch on what you just said 
when I first got into real estate, I go, I practically Googled like, what is real estate? And of course being new wholesaling comes up. So I'm like, what do I do? And they're like, go find a meetup. And this was mid 2017. The top, the first meetup that came up on the meetup app was the dirty house buyer one. And that's where I met yourself and your, your partner at the time uh, in the residential side. And actually it's funny because I was like, well, what is wholesaling? And then I t- tried it on my own, ended up on your guys' acquisitions team there for a second. And then I, everyone, there's a, a lot of the guys start training, not a lot of the guys, but like some people started transitioning into multifamily. It caught my attention. So then my next question is, what, is there any good meetups or anything around here? You're like, yeah, I'm starting one. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, so what, what meetup, what don't you do? You have the podcast with value. You have the meetup with value. Um, just from a personal experience, you provided that value to me, even though at some point I ended up taking wallpaper off a house for you, but you guys pay me, <laughs> so it's okay. <laughs> yeah. But so that's amazing. So how does that differ from Starkey multifamily though? Or is this just like, what, what's, what's the difference there? So the, the Starkey multifamily, the meetup or the company? The company overall. So the company was what I started to do multifamily and then it kind of merged into multifamily connections. So essentially, uh, you know, I I don't think that we'll be buying anything with that just because we've, we've agreed to do all the multifamily together. Um, And it didn't make sense to have a, you know, a Reed Starkey branded company if it wasn't just me anymore. So so that's why, why that's the difference between the multifamily connections and the Starkey capital. Yeah, that makes sense. And obviously when, I mean, in any business, you partner with the right people. I mean, if you're going to go up to the next level, you're obviously going to bring people with you. And obviously you've surrounded yourself with the right people to do so. So I think that's a great partnership and it'll definitely take you to uh, the next level. Now, I don't know if you want to talk about it, but you do have, or as much as you can talk about, um, you do have a deal under contract right now, correct? Not currently, no. Okay. We were getting we were getting really close on a deal uh, recently that you and I were talking about, but... Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that one didn't end up materializing into anything. Yeah. But I mean, obviously you learned something from it. And I, from what I've heard is like most of the time it's a numbers game, one in every 10, maybe the same as like, and how many, how many deals did you underwrite just to submit the LOI and even get that offer submitted and then get to that next step. So it's, it's a numbers game. So that, that makes sense. Now, actually I want to talk about this and I really like the name of this cause you have propeller property management. First of all, before we talk about the company itself, I love the name and I know the reason behind it, but I want everyone else to know, explain the name behind Propeller Property Management. Well, it has has kind of a dual meaning. So the the main (laughs) reason, you know, like a propeller pulls things forward. So kind of, you know, designed for, um, you know, pulling pulling everybody's business forward, you know, so for managing the property, we're supposed to be managing it to pull them forward into profit and things like that. So that was uh that's the main reason so the secondary is is i would like to have a uh, a helicopter of my own someday and a yacht someday and those all have propellers so but absolutely multifamily will get you that in a heartbeat too <laughs> yeah. uh, well it's gonna take some work but i think you can do that for sure now the management side itself explain your goal with that what's kind of your business model around like what's your long-term expectations with it well, so it um, was several fold. So we started looking at the efficiencies of managing um, smaller properties. So the, the real value seems to be in the smaller properties, maybe like the 30 to 70 unit multifamily. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the reason being is they're really difficult to manage and they're, they're hard to find property managers that can do it at an affordable price. And, um, you know, so you end up having a lot of people doing them, managing themselves and, and the self-managed properties are really where you see the, um, the problems, you know, they're, they maybe don't know what they're doing or, you know, somebody told them it would be really easy and they thought it would be, and they did it. So yep. the inefficiencies are really found at that sweet spot. When you get beyond a hundred, you start finding a lot of property management companies that that's all they do all day long and they're very good at what they do. Mm-hmm. So it's very easy to find somebody to run it efficiently. Um, so there wasn't or isn't really a lot of people that manage those effectively. And the people who own them and do well at them have their own property management company. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of the main motivation is to really dig down into how to run these things effectively 
and um, you know, not to mention, you know, the cost savings. So having for my single family stuff, it, it's, uh, I mean, you're paying a decent amount of money. It doesn't really make sense to run your own at a small scale, but if you're going to scale up on any, at any scale, it makes sense to really start to take over your own. So it's kind of a combination of everything that really kind of did it. Absolutely. And then I'm assuming, I mean, obviously, I mean, you're hitting that, that sweet spot that you just mentioned, but and obviously you're looking at, you know, higher unit count. I'm assuming for the sake of numbers, you're most likely going to use your own property management or only in Michigan. How's that, how's that going to work? Cause I know you're looking in other States as well. So. Yeah. So in the other States, we're looking at a hundred units and above. Mm. So those, we know that we could find other management. So I'm starting to look in the Metro Detroit area on the smaller stuff. And, and that's because we can manage it in house and and do it that way yeah so Absolutely. in in like other states like indiana uh you know ohio and st or in missouri so you need the 100 units so we can get outside management absolutely and i guess i had a a, a big question here so not really I'm trying to think <laughs> sorry about that um i kind of i'm going to backtrack here actually for a second because you have a lot going on. You have your multifamily connections, you have propeller property management, and there is, I mean, those are, you're taking on some big steps here. And like you said, you're looking for a hundred plus units. And I mean, going from obviously flipping to multifamily is a step on its own, but going to like that, that hundred unit plus level right away is like a big step. What, what's, what has, how's the process been for you transitioning from the single family or residential world to multifamily, Ben, obviously there's a lot to learn, but what has that process been like for you? Well, that's a long, a long story to answer, but that's a great question. <laughs> so, I mean, I, it started uh, really with um, some accidental rentals that I had acquired throughout the years. And um, then I kind of started buying some and, and rehabbing them, doing the whole Burr theory. Mm -hmm. um, but with no actual job or reportable income, it was impossible for me to refinance them. So I had gotten up to six rentals, um, two, I think only two at the time were rented out. And um, you know the others were still under rehab, but what happened was I was running out of money. I had no more capital of my own to, to do anything with them. So I was kind of getting a little depressed. I had talked to a bunch of, people for financing and it just wasn't happening. Mm -hmm. um, so I was struggling with that aspect and it was, it was one year. So I had one year and it was like six, the six units that I had and I was kind of feeling a little depressed, like, okay, six, six units. Like, so what next year I'm at 12 and then maybe what 18, like that's, this is just not going to work. Um, you know, in my head, I have much grander ideas of, of where I want to be. So, yeah, I was kind of feeling a little down and I was like, you know, this just isn't working. I can't see. And if I'm out of money, I can't go any further. So I can't buy anymore right now. So I was driving home and passed an apartment and there's just like a switch flipped in my head. But OK, that's it. That's where I need to go. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I went home and I signed up for uh, the Michael Blanc uh, mm. mentorship, which I, I felt confident with because uh, Josh Sterling was a part of it. And, mm -hmm. uh, I don't usually agree with paying for mentorship, but at least I knew that he was on the ground and actually doing work and, yeah. and real deal. So, um, so I felt comfortable doing that. And then we've just been running at it full steam and then maybe to elaborate on, you know, why, why, why right to a hundred, you know, why not some duplexes or fourplexes or even a 10 unit for that mm -hmm. matter. And the, the answer was the, the property management component hmm. is there's a reason that there's a lot of mismanaged size, you know, in that size range because it's not as easy to do. Yeah. You know, the are much simpler, but on the flip side, they're much harder to get because there are, they're properly managed. Usually, you know, there's, um, you know, maybe some corners that they cut or maybe they don't raise rent, but generally they're managed pretty well. 
And there's also much more sophisticated people trying to buy them. So it's a little trickier to get into. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, I think here's the interesting thing I've picked up so far in the multifamily world is as much as, I mean, like the residential side, there's obviously everything has its own legalities, but as big as multifamily is, and obviously there's a lot more underwriting, there's more of a process and everything, longer due diligence period and everything. The rules, there's like no rules. <laughs> like you submit your LOI and you like come to agreement or not, like it's nonchalant. Obviously it's, I mean, to talk, get your attorney to write off everything after the fact, but I mean, it's very, there's no rules. Like, <laughs> like I think it is a lot harder to acquire, of course. I mean, you're, it's not a single family house and that's where I think it diff differs. Um, let me ask you this, besides the scalability and management of residential real estate, which this is all common things I hear anyways, in multifamily, um, as far as last time we spoke, you'll be syndicating, right? Yes, of course, yeah. So you're gonna be, I mean, in the most professional way possible, leveraging other people's money. My question is, and I probably already know the answer to this, why you couldn't do that with residential real estate. Obviously I know some of the legalities to that, but I know some people that have raised the, you know, money from investors to take that next leap in residential. What do you think the, the pros and cons between raising money for residential versus multifamily? Obviously you just covered a few of them, but. Well, I mean, you obviously can, it's definitely doable. People do it. So I mean, you could, you could create a syndication and have your business model just buying single family houses. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously talk to your attorney before you set anything up. <laughs> I am not an attorney, but uh, essentially when you set up that syndication, you are um, say, you are saying, this is how I'm going to invest my money. So when we set up a syndication for an apartment, the rules of that, that syndication are, we are buying this apartment and we're doing this with it. And here's what, how we're going to handle your mm -hmm. investment money. Um, there are people who do syndications as funds, so where they don't necessarily have a property nailed down, they, they just raise $20 million and then that fund buys multifamily. So you could essentially do the same thing with single family. I, the reason I don't think people do it is it's, you know, on multifamily, if I raise $20 million for multifamily, I can deploy that on potentially one deal, but several deals pretty easily. Mm -hmm. So the, the back end work is little, in comparison to if I want to deploy $20 million in single family houses, uh, you know, at least here in Metro Detroit, let's say be generous at $200,000 a door, you know, it, it's going to be a lot of properties I got to find. Yeah. And, and that's, and that the work and just finding those properties and managing, you know, a hundred different rehabs and is just to me uh, would be a nightmare. So, I mean, I've never, I haven't done a hundred rehabs in my life <laughs> and, and I know that I've gotten to a point where I was maxed out. I mean, yeah. it was, it would take me, you know, I would leave at like seven o'clock in the morning and you get home at 10 o'clock at night and that was just driving to each property. And, and that's, that's too much. And then that was, believe me, much, much, much less than a hundred. So to, to manage a hundred, I mean, I don't even know how you would scale that, but I'm sure people do, <laughs> but they're definitely at a different level than, than I'm currently at. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I understand you're in the process of uh, acquiring your 100 plus units. Just from, I'm just picking off something you just, you just said. It takes up a lot of time in the single family world. You were waking up, heading over to the projects, always doing something. If you had multiple flips that probably weren't close to each other, now you're driving circles, wasting time. You know, I'm sure not every contractor is going to be there on time. You got to deal with them and everything. Obviously, you're going to have some similar things in multifamily, but just even focusing on multifamily now and taking that step away from single family, how has that freed up your time or even changed your life just, just making that transition towards multifamily? Yeah, somehow I'm busier now than I was before, <laughs> which I never seem to think it's possible, but I always squeeze a few hours out of the day. And, you know, um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I've been just underwriting a ton of deals, creating systems for uh, the property management, which is critical. Mm -hmm. 
So systems is something that, that I didn't utilize very well in uh, the renovation side of flipping the houses. And it, it is so critical to running a business and, you know, just, just on, you know, your, your podcast. So I noticed you are already creating systems for the podcast, even the first one, you know, you have the, the intro letter to say, this is what's going on and you're creating those systems. Um, so everything has systems, whether you're have them written down or not, but there's a process for everything and, and really narrow, narrowing those down is critical. So um, with the property management, just writing up a way to handle every situation. How do you handle any call? How do you communicate with the owners? How do you communicate with the tenants mm -hmm. uh, start to finish? So that that's been a ton of time. And then uh, it turns out I have to get my broker's license. So I've been studying for that. That's a 90 hour class. So I got to get that done in, <laughs> couple of weeks. So that's um, another major component to it. Absolutely. So you have the uh, Starkey multifamily meetup. Where can people find info to go attend that meetup? So it's on Facebook and meetup. Um, so I don't have the, the links memorized, but Starkey multifamily meetup, if you look for it on Facebook or uh, meetup.com. And then it's uh, the fourth Tuesday of each month in Dearborn at La Pita. So that's uh, it's our new location. So this will be our, this one on March 24th will be our first time at that location. So I'm pretty excited about it. We, we started it down in Monroe and um, the feedback was overwhelmingly negative towards the location. Um, I mean, the restaurant was good. Don't get me wrong, but just the, it was too far south for where everybody was coming from. Yeah, absolutely. And your podcast, which, by the way, you've interviewed some amazing guests on your podcast. I do watch them on YouTube and stuff. Not in a weird way. I have a Bluetooth speaker when I'm in the shower and I just play podcasts. <laughs> but uh, where can they find or listen to your podcast? Uh, so YouTube is the most common is where people are watching it is on uh, Starkey Multifamily Podcast on YouTube. Um, again, I don't have the link memorized, but... I'll have it. I'll have all the links and everything in my description as well to all your stuff. So cool. And then, yeah, I mean, any, any of your favorite uh, podcast locations, it's on, you know, iTunes and Stitcher and, and all that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Now here's the fun part of the podcast. Not that this hasn't been fun. Um, this is the part that I never really want to prepare anyone for. I have four rapid fire questions for you. They're not personal, but they are meant to bring out some personal answers to get people to learn more about you. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's keep them around 30, 30, 30 seconds each for the answer, all right? Okay. All right, first one. The best piece of advice you've ever received? Oh, man. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I've gotten a ton of advice, uh, so it's hard to say, but um, separate work and personal I mean, that's, uh, you know, just, you know, if you're having a rough day at work, don't take it home. And if you're having a rough day at home, don't take it to work or, you know, with your stuff like that. So you got to be able to take a moment, you know, like if you're, if you're coming home from work at a rough day, stop at your door. And before you cross that barrier, reset, kind of say, you know what, you know, this is a different place, a different setting. And it's not fair to my family or even myself to, continue to feel negative moving into the new situation. Absolutely. I can back that. I mean, that that's perfect. Second one. What it, since obviously in the beginning here, we had an amazing intro for you and uh, we touched on leadership very heavily. So what is your definition of leadership? Oh man. <laughs> I'd say probably, you know, doing the, doing the right thing, you know, um, doing it instead of just uh, saying it, but, you know, sometimes it, leadership is kind of push, pushing in things in the right direction. So having that oversight, um, you know, maybe maybe getting out of the, the work side and, and being able to see the overall, the arch of the, the business plan and drawing it out. So you have to have, uh, you have to have a direction that you're going in. And, you know, the, the people that are the greatest leaders have these great visions of where they're going. And if you can draw that picture and get people excited about it, that's, that's the vision. You know, you're not just creating work to do, you're creating a mission. 
So Elon Musk has his mission to go to Mars and the people that work for him are extremely passionate about that mission. So then it's not about the paycheck. It's not about the hard work. It's just about being part of that mission and being part of something. Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with that. Now, besides underwriting deals and uh, putting systems together, what keeps you up at night? Oh man, I sleep pretty good. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the only time I don't sleep good is when I uh, crash in the middle of the day from just pure exhaustion. But um, yeah, I, I usually don't give myself enough time to sleep. So when I do go to sleep, it's pretty quick. <laughs> well, that, that might be a good thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The only thing that messes me up is, uh, like I said, if I sleep during the day, then I can't. It messes me up and I'm off cycle for a few days, but that's yeah. it. <laughs> absolutely all right now this one i've always found pretty interesting to ask people i've this one i've naturally just like asking people what three people in the entire world living or dead would you like to have dinner with oh man elon musk david allen the author of getting things done oh man <laughs> and probably Although it may be a little, uh, it may be a little crazy. Probably Grant Cardone. Fair enough. He's kind of an interesting character. Yeah, that very. But I think most people they can Google multifamily and guess who's going to come up. <laughs> yeah, Grant. Well, you know, I actually don't even really particularly agree with a lot of his multifamily stuff, but he's had some interesting insights in some of his books that mm-hmm. changed uh, a lot of my perspective on life so the the one uh be obsessed or be average yep really really allowed me to you know there are certain things that i've always been different from a lot of people you know i've always had people tell me why are you doing what you do you know why do you work so hard why do you you know they're questioning everything i do and then in the back of your mind you're like well maybe there's something wrong with the way i approach the world and you know he kind of said look this is how people like you and I think and how we operate. And, and it really changed, changed my outlook to be able to say, you know what, I, I'm proud of the way I think I'm, I am excited to be an entrepreneur and it may not be for everybody, but I like the risk and I like the adventure and and that's okay. Yes. So that was the first book that actually kind of let me know that that is an acceptable and correct way of thinking and not just, what the rest of the world is saying, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? And all that stuff. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with that. And I think even you could be the most loved person on the planet, but if you're doing something entrepreneurial, people are going to look at you the weirdest ways. Like, why would you do that? Why? Like people just look right over that stuff. And it's completely fine because if you stay focused and you hit, then you just aim for whatever you want to do and make it happen. Guess who's going to be the first ones come running back when you're on your yacht with your helicopter. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah, it's, it's the iceberg of success. You know, I mean, uh, I don't know what book I'm stealing this from, but, um, it might actually be a grant. No, it's not grant Carone. I don't know who it is, but you know, so you've got your iceberg of success. So you're that success is a piece above the water, but all that work that you took to get there is underneath. And I think the book example was, um, Oprah Winfrey, you know, so people look at that and, uh, they see all the success because they're like, Oh man, she works for an hour a day doing a talk show. You know, like how hard is that? Like this is, and she's like a billionaire, but they don't see how that all came together. Mm -hmm. All the work behind the scenes, all the failures and all the rejections and all the, all the work to get there. But all you see is the tip of the success. You know, and, and any athlete would be a great example too, because there, there are no, people that are just professional athletes without the work. <laughs> no, it just doesn't happen. So, yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. Now I have here a book recommendation from you. It's GTD by David Allen. What have you picked up? First of all, why do you recommend that book? And what are some things you've picked up from it that you think are very useful? Well, since implementing it, I am easily a hundred times more effective. Um, because it allows you to really define what is important to you at the moment. You know, it allows me to have context of work to be done. So I have, um, you know, cell phone use, so tasks that I can do on my cell phone. 
So I have a list already pre-made of work that I can do on my cell phone based on time. So 15, 30, 60, or deep work, which is like a long project. Mm -hmm. So, and I have it based on office, home, different types of places that I am. But now if I got 15 minutes to play on my phone, Facebook isn't the first choice. You know, checking my email is not the first choice because I already have a list of things that I can do in 15 minutes on my phone. I think we end up on Facebook because we don't really have them defined what we need to do for that time period. And, you know, I mean, I, we can use Facebook for business purposes, but let's be honest, most of the time, <laughs> wasting time. Yes. Yep. So, you know, and it really allows me to, when you have clear defined projects and things to do, then you know exactly what it is that you have to do. So sometimes before that, if I had 30 minute window, it would take you 30 minutes to get your brain thinking about what you had to do and then figure out something to do. And now you only have 10 minutes to do it. Mm -hmm. Whereas now I've already done the work. I know what I need to do in a 30 minute window. So if I look at my calendar and I got a 30 minute window and I'm into my office, so I just pick a 30 minute window to do in my office and I do it. So it gets done. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I could probably go on all day about GT. It's, <laughs> it's been a long process. I mean, it's been a couple of years of, tuning and refining and kind of getting it down. Um, I read the book twice and failed to implement it. I had to read it a third time before I finally got it. Um, but yeah, I, I would, anybody who can read it or anybody who knows me knows that I push that book very hard. I'm a strong believer in the whole system. Absolutely. It, well, it sounds like an amazing book. That's one thing I really love about uh, asking about book recommendations. Cause I mean, the way you described it, I know as soon as after this, I'm ordering it. <laughs> So, yeah, and then, you know, the, the second part is, too, is probably the biggest part, which I forgot to mention because it's been a while, but before I had it, you've got a hundred things to do that are undone. Everybody's life has hundreds of things that are undone that need to be done. Mm -hmm. And when you clearly define what's next, you can give that item 100% of your attention because you know that you've already defined everything you need to do and you pick what is left or what is the most important and you do it. Whereas before I did that, I would start one thing and then I would do six other tasks before I finished it because I was like, Oh, I need to do this too. That's important. And then you're like, well, shoot, I got to do this. And you're jumping around and nothing gets done. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you can say, this is the most important thing, you can shut off everything in the world because you know, you've already defined everything that needs to be done and you've decided all those things don't have to be done right now. And then that, and then when you spend time with your family, you can say I'm at family time and I, I know that there's nothing that's not getting done. That's not, that's going to matter because mm -hmm. I've already looked at it all and now I can give my time to my family. Uh, so that is actually probably the most important part of it. Absolutely. Now I think, I'm going to jump back to when you said this is the busiest you've ever been. How do you think that's just because a lot of the, obviously getting your first acquisition or actually buying your property. Um, you think that's just because, you know, going into it, once you have, let's say a hundred units under contract, you've done it. You're like, you're going to free up a lot of time. Do you think that's going to make a difference? No, probably not. <laughs> so, I mean, I, so part of the GTD that has allowed me to be is more effective of my time use. So it's allowed me to be more busy. Mm. Um, so my personality does not allow me to have free time. It just doesn't work. I have to have something to do. Uh, so it really, you know, every time I get more effective or efficient, I just fill it in with more work. And then I have to be a little bit stressed. <laughs> There's just a, uh, I've come to terms with it. You know, when I was younger, I'd complain like, Oh, I'm so busy. And then I realized that I'm the reason I'm busy. So I'm doing it on purpose. That makes um, sense. So, yeah, I don't think that'll go away. I mean, eventually, you know, I'll probably stop working so hard, but I don't see really a desire to do that anytime soon. I got some pretty lofty goals to get to and <laughs> there's only so much time in my life and I want to get it done as soon as possible. So it tends to be it's a very, you know, common mindset when it comes to entrepreneurs and stuff. And sometimes I find it thinking, going to sleep actually sometimes stresses me out. Can you relate to that? 
I used to be able to. So that's <laughs> that that is a pre GTD problem mm. because you've got a hundred plus tasks that aren't done. And if you haven't looked at all those tasks and said those are all okay to do another time, then when you go to sleep, your brain's going, Oh my goodness, I didn't get that email sent out, or I didn't do this, I didn't do that, I gotta finish editing the podcast. Oh my goodness, yep. I got all this stuff. But when you have it really locked down and a really locked down, then it's all off your mind because you've already looked at it all. Absolutely. All right, I got I got a little too deep into that, but that was actually really interesting. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. But okay. um so right now, here's your the time, shameless promotion time. You can honestly, I mean, we've talked about, you know, your your uh, meetup link, link to your YouTube channel and your podcast and everything will be in the description of uh, my podcast in the description for those watching. Um, what are some other things you maybe want to promote? Maybe this would be a solid time to explain where or give some information to any uh, accredited investors listening. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you covered uh, pretty much uh, all of it. I mean, if you know somebody wants to talk to me about um, investing or multifamily or even my experience in single family, I'm I'm never really uh, too hesitant to share information. I don't think anything that I do is proprietary. Um, so if you want to reach out to me on Facebook, it's probably the easiest. Uh, I have the multifamily uh, meetup or multifamily group. If you reach out on there and, and ask questions or reach out to me, uh, you know, I'm, I'm more than willing to, to help you out. So, you know, I, I certainly love to talk to anybody who's accredited and they want, you want to talk about investing passively. Um, you know, we always want to bring those people on. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, like I said, most of it really is not for, for my benefit, but we do have the podcast. We do have the, the meetup. Everybody's welcome to be there. Um, you know, it's fun. It's fun to see it grow and we'd love to see you there. Absolutely. So I know you said it's not to your, your benefit, but I think it might be in the long term. It is. Yeah. I mean, so it is, but it's not, I guess it's not that I'm selling something, you know, no, of there's, course. there's no pressure. There's nothing there. It's, you know, we're, we're really trying to benefit everybody else. And I, I think, um, you know, one of my personal heroes, um, it, you know, Josh Sterling says it best as he says, you know, when he can help other people, it, it really helps you uh, think about it differently. So if I'm teaching something and, and I have to think of how to explain it to somebody who doesn't know it, it changes the way that I think about it. You know, so I may have already, I may think I'm already past learning a certain portion of real estate. Mm -hmm. Think through it enough to explain it to somebody it actually helps me get better. And then sometimes that person may ask me questions that I've never thought about. So it is really truly amazing at how much helping other people can benefit yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Reed, I appreciate you being on. Um, it was an honor having you as my very first guest. So uh, yeah. thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity and uh, I wish you the best luck and I think you're going to do great. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Hey, what's going on? Matt Barnett here with Barnett Capital. Thank you so much for listening to today's podcast. All future podcasts will be posted on facebook.com forward slash Barnett Capital Co. You can also find us on YouTube, Anchor, Spotify, Breaker, Google Podcasts, Pocket Cast, and Radio Podcast. Thank you so much for listening.